I, I view that this, this, this period is fairly inevitable. Any, any asset that becomes a trillion dollar liquid asset is going to get ETFs built on it in some jurisdictions. And in the United States case, um, you know, we, we have some degree of separation of powers. And so even though the SEC didn't particularly want this, they, they lost in court. Um, and so it, it, people want this. Um, and so now more people can access it. There are pools of capital that, you know, there's retirement accounts, there's managed assets, um, and a lot of them have not been able to access it. Um, and now they can. Despite the rising demand for Bitcoin facilitated by the approval of 12-spot Bitcoin ETF in the United States, many investors remain cautious about these products and their potential impact on the leading cryptocurrency network. Critics have raised concerns about centralization, the potential co-opting of Bitcoin, and the risk of future confiscation. Acknowledging some validity in these concerns, renowned investment strategist and macro analyst Lynn Alden argues that the benefits of spot Bitcoin ETF far outweigh the risks. Alden is optimistic that these ETF can significantly contribute to the ongoing expansion and enhancement of Bitcoin. She believes that this development was inevitable and is ultimately a positive step for the cryptocurrency's future. So, and there's there's like imbalances built up. So the fact that they could only access it with, with like grayscale uh, has been an issue. And now there's kind of like this big release valve where a lot of capital can finally get out of that big entrapment and move to other places that are that are kind of more professionally managed or cheaper uh, and, and things like that. So I think that that's, that's a process that's inevitable. Um, I think concerns around centralization are, are somewhat overblown. Not to say that they shouldn't be brought up, um, but, but basically I think that, you know, there already was a pretty big chunk of Bitcoin sitting in grayscale. Now it's rotating into BlackRock and Fidelity and, and a few others. Um, the overall pie is growing moderately that, that's in those environments. A lot of people in those environments, they prefer that. Whereas I, th I think it's, it's important to say make self-custody reasonably easy for people to, to make sure people understand the risks. Um, but I think, again, it's just people have more optionality now. There, there are a lot of people that, that wanted to have Bitcoin in their 401k and couldn't. Now they have more options or, you know, they're, 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 you know, they have assets with an RIA and he or she is just unable or unwilling to put some of that money into Bitcoin. Now they can. Um, and so I think that's overall, that's inevitable. It's not, it's, even if it's not good or bad, it's just inevitable, right? So it's not like, I see people saying, oh, Bitcoin deviated from its mission because ETFs exist for it now. Well, it's like, well, Bitcoin didn't make the ETFs. The fiat system made ETFs for Bitcoin. And that's, that's basically the fiat system upgraded its APIs to plug Bitcoin in in this method. Et ETFs are basically an API into different asset classes. They decided to plug into Bitcoin now. And you, know, you watch out for, for big, big centralized honeypots, whether it's ETFs, whether it's Binance, you know, whenever a lot of Bitcoin are in one big custodian, that is a risk. So right now, a lot of them are in Coinbase. I consider that not ideal. Um, and but I, so I think people should be cautious about that. If you're going to hold ETFs, you probably should diversify uh, across custodians. But I also think that, you know, it, it's good to take self-custody. Um, and so, we'll, you know, we'll see where that shakeouts over time. But I think that that's just an inevitable stage that Bitcoin was go always going to go through if it was ever going to get as big as it has now. I mean, I think there's a risk, but I, I view it as overblown because I view Bitcoin as well-designed as is. Um, you know, it has a block size limit for a reason. And, you know, I, I think that basically uh, the market forces will play out. I think, you know, basically, if you view what Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is the most immutable and decentralized database we've ever made uh, as humanity. The, I think the biggest killer use case for that is money. If you have a really good decentralized open ledger, money is like by far the biggest adjustment market for that. That's like a hundred trillion dollar market in today's dollar terms. That's like a it's a massive market. The total adjustable market for that, uh, in theory, is is huge. And the you know you can use that. You can like you can you can timestamp other things to prove that they were not changed. You can use it for speculative meme tokens. I, I think most of, most of those fat. I mean that's like you know at most a few trillion dollar market non-monetary use cases for, for the most immutable database. I, I think that over the long arc of time, uh, the monetary use case is way more denser. It's a way bigger market. And it pushes that aside. I think that while, while Bitcoin gets adopted, as it goes through, as more people look at it and figure out things they can do with it, it goes through these manias. It goes through fads. Um, I think they burn themselves out over time. 
we see when you look at the altcoin space, you go through this 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 boom for period, and then we forget that narrative. We go through the next big boom, then we forget about that narrative. We go through the next big boom. Now, kind of the current cycle is nothing particularly new, but taking some of that other stuff and putting it on Bitcoin. I think this is going to go through a big boom, and then a you know that that kind of washes itself out. And I'm sure someone will think of the next thing, and it will go through that that fad, and that can be disruptive while it happens. But I think that ultimately that it's it's not particularly economic. If people want to, you know, if, if there's demand for meme coins, there's an endless supply of meme coins that come to the market until they saturate that demand. And then all those people that bought meme coins basically get poor. And then the, the money flows to the miners. And it's annoying for people that are trying to use Bitcoin monetarily for that period of time. But at the end of the day, they still have their money. All the people that bet on JPEGs and you know, mean coins are are poorer now, unless they were the handful of sharks at the top. They were basically chilling it and cashing out at the top. And, you know, th- those those kind of sharks make money, but most people lose money. And then it kind of goes back to stability. So I think that's kind of part of something that it has to go through. I heard about Bitcoin back in like 2010 or so. And uh, I was never one of those people that was like adversarial toward it. I was never like, oh, that's stupid. or But I was kind of like, what's the chance that works? Or uh, that sounds neat. I should probably put more time into it and then I never get around to it, right? So it's kind of like neutral toward it. We're like, I'm rooting for those guys, but what are the, what are the chances that this is the money that finally, you know, is this Hayek, Hayekian money? And, uh, but when, when you watch it go through like three cycles of, you know, it, it has a big adoption cycle. It goes down 75% or more. Uh, it recovers, goes up to another big cycle, goes down. Over, you know, kind of every cycle, I would go and like look at the ecosystem and see the UX was getting better. And so I finally like was like, okay, I have to put the time in to understand this. And so I, I did that back in 2017. And then I watched the block size war play out. Uh, and all of that was very informative. Basically, it, it, it kind of showed things in practice. Who, you know, who controls the network? How immutable are the rules of the network? How do network effects work in this, in this um, industry? Is is the you know ultimately? I mean, Bitcoin is control logic. It's a, it's a system. Is the system stable? Um, and when you see it operate through multiple environments, the answer is yes. And so basically, once I saw Bitcoin reach a degree of critical mass and prove itself as as fairly anti fragile, I said, well, it is, if if no one can kill this thing, and if it is um, now kind of a critical mass of network effects. Then that has macro implications. Now, now there's a money that moves faster than fiat while being scarcer than gold, and that that has macro implications. So, for example, there's 160 different fiat currencies in the world. All of them are local monopolies of their own jurisdiction, and they control that monopoly in a handful of ways. One is that obviously they tax everything other than their own currency in their jurisdiction, um, but then two, they control the the inflows in and out of that country, right? So if you want to bring value into a country, there's really two main ways to do it uh, in the in the pre-Bitcoin era. One is ports of entry, which are obviously pretty easy to surveil. Um, you know, some gets through, but it's you know it's pretty limited. Um, and then two is is wire transfers in and out, but they're also surveilled and controlled. Whereas when you have internet money, you know you can you can you know any anyone in that country can just hold up a QR code on a video call and I can send it to them. Uh, they can send me a payment string. They can, you know, so ev- every person in that country that's internet connected can get money from outside. There's it's way, the the borders of that money are now way more porous, um, so they're less locked into their local monopoly. More can go out and and participate in the free market of monies around the world. So if they want, and the same thing applies to some extent with stablecoin, which is that they can say, well, I w- instead of Egyptian pounds, I want U.S. stablecoins to hold for the next three months, and they're centralized, but it's a it's a market of money now. So they're saying, well, instead of my local currency, I want something that's reasonably stable that that I want to hold. And so, you know, they'll, they'll get stable coins. If they want something longer term, they'll get Bitcoin. And that that has macro implications. That breaks apart all those borders. And then when you look at macro, so, like size matters, liquidity matters. It, just just because something exists, if it's not being understood at scale, then it doesn't really matter yet. And so in the first 10 years of, of, of Bitcoin's history, it wasn't really at a size that really impacted macro. Whereas in the past five years or so, it finally got big enough where it's starting to have an impact. Similar for stablecoins, like th- these things matter on some sort of macro flow scale now. 
And so they, they can they can now change how currencies operate because now, for example, um, various currencies are under more pressure, which I think is good because their people have more options to escape those currencies uh, and they can hold whatever currency they want. I think Bitcoin's the best one, but you know, if they want to hold dollar stable coins or gold backed stable coins or whatever, they 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 have various kind of choice now. And though that the fact that all those financial borders are super porous um, allows allows market forces to exist on money in a way that it's been stopped from doing for the past many decades because of these kind of enforceable local monopolies.